And today we are talking about biggest mistakes screenwriters make. And yay! And I'm here with Jim and Anna. Hello, Jim. What's up, world? <laughs> Hello, Anna. Hey, everybody. Hey! So today's webinar has three parts. Before you get signed, after you get signed, and the Q&A at the end. So let's dive right in with our first mistake, which oh, Tanya, is... Tanya, Tanya yes? can, I, can I just say that every single one of these mistakes I personally have made? <laughs> All right. Yeah, me too. Uh, I mean, yeah, <laughs> ongoing. <laughs> exactly. Hence... We know where off we talk. All right, so what is the lottery mindset? Well, uh, the lottery mindset, I like to refer to the lottery mindset as this sort of completely erroneous state of mind that writers tend to have, that being that, you know, if you just spam like a hundred festivals or send out a thousand query letters to producers, one of them will certainly see your genius and sign you. Now, of course, there's a certain logic to that. I mean, there might be something in your screenplay or your pilot that speaks to a specific type of person that maybe the vast majority might not get, especially if it's something that, that's extremely specific, you know, like black comedies or something. That's not something a lot of people tend to tend to get. But the people who love black comedies love black comedies. So, so there is something to that mindset but but what i'm talking about specifically is the the feeling that you know your script is great you just need to find the right person to appreciate it more often than not that's not true and what i found is true is that if a script is good no matter what the genre and I, and i mean good like you know good enough that people will rave about it and call you up and volunteer to help you rather than you having to ask them to do things for you when it's at that level it doesn't matter what the genre is, it, or at least it matters less. And you you generally know when you're at that level when, you know, that exact thing happens. You know, people volunteer to help you. People proactively come up to you and say, wow, I really enjoyed that. Um, you know, you get great coverage scores. You get great scores on Blacklist. All these things will tell you that you're really in the game. And that's when you should when you're at that level, after you've done as many rewrites as it takes generally to get to that point, that's when you should really concentrate on, you know, sending out as many submissions as you can. Not just after you finish your first draft and you go and you spend a thousand dollars of your hard earned money to enter uh, 15 festivals. Absolutely. And I think it also comes down to, you know, sometimes we don't want to think that people could possibly have constructive criticism or notes on our work so it's like well maybe this person just didn't get it let's you know send it to this next person who you know might get it but usually it means that maybe some more work is necessary and again i've done this you know uh, uh, and i mean probably all of us have you know i mean I, you get extremely frustrated and you're just like okay great i'm going to send out 200 query letters today and you know especially when it comes to query letters really there's nothing wrong with that because so few people tend to actually read query letters in the first place, it really does tend to be a crapshoot. But especially for contests in particular, when you're paying for those submissions, in theory at least, they are supposed to read every single one. Absolutely. Anna, you've uh, coordinated lots of contests. Have you uh, seen this phenomena? Oh, sure. I mean, I think, um, I think there's also a tendency to people tend to think about their their writing in a, with a very, very narrow focus. And I mean, if your goal is to be a career writer, you know, you kind of have to step back and say, okay, this is one project out of dozens that I'm going to write. You know, if you put all of your energy into, into the one project and trying to get it out there, you might be doing a disservice to yourself uh, on the whole and kind of driving yourself crazy in the process. And, you know, contests, like uh, you'll get contests, uh, submissions, people will submit to contests, and just the leveling of anxiety over, oh my God, I have to win, I have to place in this one contest. Really, it's just one contest, you guys. <laughs> Guaranteed, <laughs> no one's gonna remember it later on. <laughs> Do it and keep going. <laughs> exactly. 
All right, that was the lottery mindset. And similar to the lottery mindset is sending, sending out, out scripts, scripts too, too early. early. Now we've all done that. Oh, oh yeah. man, this is, <laughs> right. the, this is probably, I, I not only have I made this mistake, I think I invented it. Um, going back 30 <laughs> years that I've been a screenwriter now, uh, I, I think I was actually sending out screenplays when I was still in utero um you know uh, just uh you know, and you never learn you never you know when when you send something out and and it's just not there yet and you hear the those notes back when people do actually give you notes like producers and stuff who are honest enough to tell you the truth and you go oh crap and you realize well shit you know this is something i could have actually fixed if i had had the presence of mind to do that but uh, I didn't know. I was just so eager and so excited. I just had to get it out there. And of course, you, you, you know, we delude ourselves. We get into this, this moment where it's like, OK, I'm done. I finished the draft. I incorporated those notes. How could it possibly be any better? Boom, you pull the trigger. And of course, six months later, you realize, oh, my God, the script was so much worse than that it is now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, that'll be fine. That'll be fine. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Anna. I was gonna say that ties back into the, the previous one too. It's that this this general mentality of this is my only chance. And it's never your only chance. I mean, better to any anybody, any producer, any manager, any agent would rather you take the time and get the script really, really, really good than send them something that's kind of half assed and not finished. You know, yeah. so it's never your only shot. That's Ab absolutely. Ever. And I think it's also a, a matter of you know, often we think, oh, I've done whatever, three drafts of this. You mean it's not perfect yet? <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I start incorporating in into my uh, coverage reports just lines about, you know, 20 drafts, 30 drafts. That's not out of the ordinary at all because it's not. It's not. I mean, I, I believe I've done at least 20 drafts of every script I've ever written. Yeah, Jordan Peele has been really right. upfront and Frank about that, talking about how many drafts it took to get get out to the point where, uh, you know, it, it was as good as it was. And um, I think it was I think he said it like it wasn't even till draft 17 or so that he actually came up with like the main twist, the main the main hook uh, for what the whole movie was really about. I mean, it took him that long just to kind of find it. Uh, and I don't remember how many drafts. I think it was like 20 or 30. No, he's, I think 36. Is that what he said? Yeah, so, something yeah. like that. Yeah, the drafts until it was like, okay, let's go produce this thing. So um, I think we, you know, you know, hopefully it will come faster and sooner to all the rest of us. But, um, you know, I, I, I just, I can't tell you how many times, you know, we just, uh, we delude ourselves into thinking just because we so want to, get the script out there and get that adulation or get that sale or land a manager or something that that we pull the trigger without actually knowing if it's there yet or not. And sadly, usually, uh, usually the case is it isn't. Exactly. Right. And number three, not learning your craft, a.k.a. trying to fudge it or having others fix it for you. But mm, I like fudge. Fudge is fudge. good. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Fudge. I think this one is like a disclaimer, though. I mean, I, you know, we don't want to encourage people to not get help when they need it. You know, like I'm all in favor of hiring a proofreader because you're always going to miss stuff. Um, but at the same time, like if you don't know what you're doing to begin with, or if you're constantly, uh, here's an example. I I did uh, some ghostwriting for this guy years ago, who. Um, he would constantly send me stuff that he had written and gotten notes on, and he couldn't figure out how to fix it. So he sent it to me and I and I'd do a rewrite and then send it back to him. And then he wouldn't learn from that and he'd send it out for notes again. And then say like this endless cycle of just trying to fix stuff over and over and over again. But he never actually learned how to write. So <laughs> so he never got anywhere with it. And I was I was never surprised, you know. Um, you really, you have to know what you're doing. You have to learn, take the time to learn what you're doing. Yeah, learn your craft. And this is my uh, uh, soapbox sidebar uh, that I, you know, sometimes climb onto. It seems that 
often when it comes to the arts, people have this idea that I can just roll out of bed one morning and decide that now I'm a writer, now I'm, I'm an actor, now I'm whatever, because I just decided I am that. Nobody would do that if they wanted to be a doctor. They'd go to medical school, right? And it wouldn't like walk into the ER and say, well, you know, hand me whatever, a patient and some medical instruments. I, but, I don't and, understand what you mean. What <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. So, you know, it's the same as with any profession. You learn your craft. Well, look, I mean, specifically here, what we're talking about is, it, it, look, as Anna said, there, you know, if if you if you need a proofreader or, or something like that, by all means, you know, find that person to help you out. We, we all have blind spots. We all have weaknesses. You know, yes, seek out that help. Of course. I don't think that's what, what, what we're getting at. I, I think what we're specifically getting at, kind of what you were alluding to, Tanya, is just once again, this sort of deluded mentality where you know, you don't have to do it. Other people will do it for you. I mean, we see this all the time here at Coverage Inc. We get right. screenplays in where, you know, the dialogue is missing and it'll just say like, oh, they talk about something or another here. Or like, no, who do you think is going to write that dialogue, dude? That's you. You're the screenwriter. You do that, you know, or people just send in stuff and um, they're like, well, I was able to get it this far, but now can you guys rewrite it to get it to the point where... It'll win contests or or whatever, and you know of course we could, but we really don't like to do that because the whole idea is to get you to the point where you can you can do it yourself. You know, I mean, you have to be able to do it yourself. Look, let's be clear: if you are talking in terms of getting a movie produced, then of course just any way that you can get the the script as good as you can, just for that one production, then do it. That's what producers do. But if you're talking about getting representation and having in, an agent or a manager actually shop you around and send you out to general meetings and introduce you to the town as a new talent, one script is not going to do it. So even if you hire someone to make that script great and it comes out amazing, if you can't replicate that over and over and over again, you're dead in the water. It doesn't matter. You'd have to hire those same people over and over and over again to rewrite your screenplay for you or to get you where you need to be. And that's not doing anybody any good. That's like hiring a plumber and the plumber comes in and says, OK, well, um, let me bring in this other guy who's the actual plumber. You know, eh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I also think like it's good to know your weaknesses too. I mean, I everyone's yeah everyone's weaknesses kind of shift. The more you write, the more you'll get better at one thing and maybe not so good at the other one. When I first started out, dialogue I was terrible at dialogue, but I was really good at, at action writing. And now, now I'm much better at dialogue. But there are certain sections of, of any script that I write that have they're just they're just not as strong. And I come to recognize those are the areas that I need to work on more so than others. Um, I was a screenwriter that's because that way when I get those notes back. <laughs> I was a screenwriter for 20 years before I even learned what subtext was. <laughs> <laughs> True story. True story. <laughs> Excellent. All right. On to the next one. Pitches and meetings not being concise and compelling. What? You mean writers aren't concise? Oh boy, where do I even begin with this one? Um, so, so well, look, I hate pitching, so I'm gonna. Yeah, well, <laughs> none of us like pitching. It's just, it, you know, it's unfortunately part of the job description. And you know, there, there's these wonderful outlets like you know Stage 32 and Roadmap Writers and places like that where you can just you know you get a few minutes to pitch someone online, and and that's amazing. I mean, the the the, the level of people that you're being introduced to. Uh, instantaneously for you know your 30 bucks or whatever it's just it, it's it's freaking cool but it does mean that you're on the spot and all of a sudden now you and your sh shining smiling personage are going to have to be really compelling and entertaining and engaging uh and, and cool and wonderful as well as you know smart and an incredible raconteur all within the space of like five the five minutes that you get that's a tall order. I mean, not a lot of us are really given that gift, you know, um, like you said, Anna, n none of us really likes pitching. You know, it's 
it's not something if you're a screenwriter that you're generally good at. I mean, there are uh, obviously there there are some. I'd probably say maybe five to ten percent of us who are just really great at that. But look, you know, this is the reason why former super agent turned producer Emil Gladstone used to send all of his clients to acting school. He actually did this because it's a performance. It's like, you know, you've got five minutes or 10 minutes, or if it's an actual pitch meeting in person, if you're lucky enough to get one of those where you're going in and you're sitting down in a room with executives, maybe a half hour uh, to sell someone on your story. How can you do that in the most compelling and appealing and concise way as possible in the time allotted, whether it's five minutes or whether it's 15 minutes or whether it's a full hour? Um, it's a tall order, but I mean, first of all, you have to start with taking a real hard look at yourself and realizing, okay, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? If you're, um, you know, like me, a 55 year old man, and you're going in and you've got, and you're pitching to a room full of, uh, you know, 23 year olds, you're automatically going to be behind the eight ball. Um, so what do you do? You will, first of all, you should probably be, um, dynamic, you know, you, you have to like sort of, uh, you know, work with what you've got, you know, if, if you're, it, it, don't go in and be like, um, it, it, don't go in and be the worst possible version of yourself, whatever that is, be the best possible version of yourself and write out your, and I know you do this, Tanya, you can speak to oh, this, yeah. you know, write out your, your pitch in like a page and, and then practice it in front of a mirror. Isn't that what you do? Yeah, no, I definitely, um, Write out your pitch and practice your pitch because, as Jim said, it is a performance. So go in there and perform. You've got whatever, you know, make sure your pitch isn't any longer than two or three minutes. So they have a chance to ask you questions and they will be very thankful if it's short, concise and engaging. Yeah, it's better to be too short and then have you have them ask follow up questions than to keep droning on and have them lose interest. So uh, a tight and punchy. And, you know, the main thing is, you know, you have to be you have to project that you are a cool person to work with. That's the most important thing, because if they enter into any sort of relationship with you, whether they option your script or start working on a new thing that they ask you to write for them, which would be amazing, um, whether it's paid or not, it, it doesn't matter because that begins a relationship. Um, you need to be that person that they want to hang out with because they're going to be spending a lot of time with you. So the, the first thing that they're thinking is, is this person someone that I can deal with on an ongoing basis? Well, that's maybe not, not the first thing. The first thing is probably, you know, is this person's story sense any good? But the second thing is the person themselves. So, you know, think about who you are and how you can best project the best possible version of yourself to these people, as well as your story. Very good. I think okay. the last thing I, I would also say, you know, don't, don't be apologetic. I, I think every writer has a tendency. We have this tendency to say, oh, well, it's not, it's not good enough or, oh, I'm, you know, the draft is, I'm still working on it or, or whatever. But I think there's this, uh, it, I think that's bad. I think if we have, you have to have confidence in your material before anyone else will, you know? So when you, especially when you're in a room with people who are considering selling it, I mean, if you don't love it, they're not going to either. Absolutely, absolutely. Jim, good enough, seldom is. <laughs> first of all, <laughs> first of all, I want this CD. <laughs> now I'd like to point out that not, not only- yeah, no, that that's yeah. These, the, yeah. So I'd like to point out that not only did these two schmucks from obviously 1981 uh, call their band "quote unquote" good enough, but the label or, or the uh, the record name is Dodgy, which if you're familiar with British slang means not so good. <laughs> I, I love that. Um, okay, look, good enough. All right, so so specifically here in this instance, you know what what we're talking about is. You know, I, I've seen this a lot of times where screenwriters get their script to what they think is good enough. Um, you know, that being like, OK, well, you know, it's um, I've consistently gotten to the quarterfinals when I send this out for contests. Therefore, my script is good enough because clearly it made it to the second round in, in a lot of different contests. And so, I mean, look, that that is validation that is saying, yeah, you've got you've got some talent. You've got something on the page. 
Um, but it also means you didn't make it to the semis. And it also means you didn't make it to the finals. And it also means you weren't in the top 10 and you didn't win. And people know this. So, you know, if you're querying people saying, you know, yeah, I've made the semifinalist or, or even the, the, you know, quarterfinalist or semifinalist in, in, you know, various different contests or whatever, what is that going to tell people? That's going to tell people, well, there's a lot of other people out there who did better than you. Why should I read this script? Um, so that, so that's one definition of that. But the, the other definition of that is, um, you know, there, there are at least what used to be known as programmers um, in, in, in the business, which basically means, you know, like movies that are made for a, for a price that were a, of a certain genre. And these tended to be, you know, things that were just made to fill the pipeline and sell, you know, direct to, to DVD or direct to foreign, you know, and, and like, for example, Taken was supposed to be one of those. And, and it just blew up and turned into this big, huge movie. But Taken was originally just supposed to be an affordable, cheap, you know, action thriller programmer. Um, and, you know, there there was a lot of companies who who made who made these types of movies and they were never intended to be something that were going to be like huge box office bonanzas. But, you know, the people who wrote those movies tended to get them to the quote good enough stage, which was, you know, hopefully you'd get, uh, you know, th- uh, you know, 62% on Rotten Tomatoes, that was good enough. All right. In the business, if you're sending out a spec script, good enough is not. It needs to be fantastic. If you are not well enough connected uh, to know a lot of people who can walk you in the doors of places where, in that case, good enough is good enough. But I'm talking exactly. about. Exactly. Yeah. Jim, let me just jump in here with oh, yeah. another soapbox sidebar. Oh, please. Um, because... Go for it. <laughs> because I, I think a lot of writers, don't get the idea that there are two different sets of rules. One rule, one set of rules is for the people that are connected, you know, their mother or father or aunt or uncle is in the business. Um, You know, good enough is good enough for them. If you are not connected, good enough is not good enough for you. You gotta stand out. All right, that was my soapbox there. sidebar. And thank you for so neatly <laughs> summarizing it. I mean, I mean, look, there, there's got to be reasons why people like Alex Kurtzman continue to get jobs year after year <laughs> after year when <laughs> you know these people have proven that they cannot uh, write something of any level of quality ever, and yet they get hired over and over. Why is that? Well, it's certainly not due to what's on the page. Exactly. Anna, do you want to add anything right. about the? No, I think I think that's exactly that's exactly it. I mean, there's the entire sort of pricey B movie genre is a thing unto itself, and I guarantee you know you look at the whoever's producing it, whoever somebody somebody's related to somebody in that. It's like the, <laughs> the, the all that industry nepotism has to has to have some kind of a hallmark, and also to the scripts are easy to spot i mean if you get a script a reader can spot one of those scripts in just a few pages you know they're they're not terrible but they're just eh, you know yeah exactly I mean, and, and and we're always shocked when we find somebody got signed or somebody got sold off of that you're just like really that script that one really but yeah yeah. yeah the cream does rise and you know this is what all of us are up against every one of us are up against this and we need to be aware of it and understand that and make our scripts as bulletproof as they can possibly <laughs> and, be. Which is why you need right. this. Special sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Special <Go ahead>. vegan. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it'll be good on a vegan burger too. Tom, oh, okay, so. good. All right, so, talk about this special sauce you need. What so, is so, the special sauce? Look, okay, so... Sp- a lot of people refer to quote special sauce as being like the little extra something something or or you know what is it about your screenplay or your pilot or something that makes it different um and you know look there there's just so many so many zombie movies uh that you can write there you know there's just so many werewolf movies you can write there's just so many serial killer movies that you can write a- a- after a while you know, people's eyes roll up into their head. It's boring. Nobody wants to read these tropes over and over unless 
you've got special sauce. And, you know, I mean, if you write a zombie movie, that's like, well, yeah, it's a zombie invasion, but they're invading the nearby town that is actually run and governed by vampires and the vampires now have to fend off this zombie invasion but they can't suck their blood because zombies don't have any what whatever but the point is it's different and people then go ah okay well i wouldn't have read a, a vampire movie because they bore me to pieces but now maybe i'll read this one so there's your special sauce i mean a terrible example off the top of my head but you know um that that's well, what here, we're talking well, about here, here's a good example um the vampire genre was dead for quite some time and then joss whedon and buffy came along and the special sauce is quite clear there um it's about the the protagonist is the girl who would normally be the first one to get killed and she slays the vampires. So hence, suddenly we had vampires all over the place again. Yep. Right. I think in the in the, in the newer, you know, last, uh, well, I guess it's not new anymore, but, you know, things like Let the Right One In or yeah. um, What We Do in the Shadows, just something that takes yes. the familiar yeah. and makes it un Exactly. Yes. Yeah, if exactly. you haven't seen what, what, what We Do in the Shadows, that's a, a really fun sort of, re basically it, it turns vampires and, and monsters in general that they kind of do it like mtv's the real world which is uh you know like a reality show version of it and, and again it's it's a reinvention of a certain trope in a way that we haven't seen it before that's what we mean by special sauce so take a look at what you're doing and ask yourself is this really different is there something about it that it does it have special sauce what is that hook that one element to it that is going to make it stand out where people don't go Oh, it's a romantic comedy. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so a romantic I, comedy with this. Yeah. Uh, so in other words, also the, one way to look at it is I think often writers try to be somebody else. They try to ape, you know, someone or someone's, uh, you know, someone's way of writing because this person is famous or whatever. But basically, you also have to really be yourself. What is special about you and find that? Because that is that is your special sauce in so many words. You know, who are you and bring that to the page. Cool. All right. Not taking notes and getting defensive <laughs> oh writers never do that what are you talking about <laughs> oh dear okay so um once again i've made this mistake a million times um the, the really funny thing is you know having run coverage inc for 17 years now you know we've gotten a lot of emails from clients over the years extremely thankful and appreciative we've gotten way less pe emails from people but still you know, you know, complaining or, or ripping us a new one, but still they do come in and, and they always look exactly the same. It's like, okay, so-and-so reader doesn't know what they're talking about and here's why. And here's my four pages of detailed things that the reader quote got wrong in their interpretation of the screenplay, which usually is not wrong. It's just, you know, what they thought was on the page was not. Um, and, um, you know, and then saying so and so really liked my screenplay, like this contest, I made it to the quarterfinals, and so and so agent really, really liked it. And they're, in other words, being extremely defensive. So rather than taking the notes in the spirit that, with which they were intended, which is constructive criticism and to help you elevate your material, people take it as an attack. I understand that. I've done it myself. I have sent that exact same letter to people who've read my screenplay, which is why I know it's completely spurious, you know, because once you actually have that presence of mind to take a, take a real long, hard look at your writing and realize, oh shit, maybe there really is something to what these people are saying, then, you know, the, the cold hard truth starts to set in. But really that's the only way I think you can actually sort of come to the light. So, um, but but we've seen it over and over, you know, and even even with like contest winners, we had a contest, uh, you know, of course, we used to run Writers on the Storm for, for many years. We, we had a, a contest winner, uh, I guess, about 10 years ago or so, who, you know, he wrote a damn good screenplay, but he wouldn't do any of the notes. And I said, uh, look, you know, here's my notes. And, um, you know, are you going to do another draft before we send it out to the agents and managers? And he's like, no, I think the script's good the way it is. And 
it didn't go anywhere. Of course, it didn't go anywhere. I I, I told him on the spot it wasn't going to go anywhere because he had these these things that that were broken in his screenplay, despite the obvious talent on the page. He refused to do it. So that's my soapbox, Tanya. <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah, we do see that a lot. And um, Anna, you've seen a lot of those too because you have to respond to them. Yeah. I, I have. I also think too that I think knowing, knowing which notes to take or knowing what someone is trying to say when they give you a note, I think takes a lot of time to learn as well. Uh, because if someone says, I don't, I didn't connect with the character, that, that, that could be a little hard to unpack sometimes. So I, I think the, the best advice that I like to give is like after you get notes is to just kind of step back and like think about it for a few days before you write that email. <laughs> Because sometimes it's a lot easier to go back and look at those notes again after you have that initial knee jerk. Oh my God, yeah. you know what are what are they? They hate my scripts. Reaction, uh, and it's kind of hard to take that not personally, um, yeah. which because it's both a business and an art, it's you know it's always going to be that m messy combination. So it's good to like just kind of take a breath. Let it let the notes settle for a little bit and then go back and say, OK, is this actually you know, what are they really trying to say about this? What did I not what did I not do correctly this time or what am I not being clear enough about uh, in this draft that I might be able to fix for the next time? Exactly. And yeah. I mean, but yeah, we get the, we get you know, all the time. It's this is normal. Every writer, <laughs> every writer does it. <laughs> I do it. Not as much as I used to. Yeah. All right. And I think that is the end of our uh, before you get signed section. So now we're getting to the after you get signed. And, you know, I think it's very important to talk about mistakes that you can make after you get signed, because often for writers, this seems to be like the end point in their heads. Oh, I got signed. That's it. That's the end point. That's everything I've been uh, working towards. And that's not usually the case. So you have to manage expectations, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, look, e e yeah. exactly as you just said, we're, we all just sort of expect that once we get signed, our agent and manager is going to, you know, clap us on the back and say, okay, now I'll take it from here. <laughs> and yeah, it's, I mean, look, there is a little bit of that. I mean, that's great. Your, your, your agent or your manager will, you know, mention you in conversations when they have their breakfast or lunch or whoever with so-and-so in the industry, if they hear about a project that they think you might be a good fit for. But, you know, you, you need to understand that agents tend to have a lot of clients, usually between like 60 and 80 or more. Um, managers less, thankfully. But, you know, that that's a lot of people they need to look out for. And, and they're going to service their hotter clients first. Uh, you know, unless you are really, really smoking coming off of some some big deal or, you know, festival win or, or something that got you a lot of attention, you're probably not going to be their top priority. It doesn't mean that they're not keeping you in mind. Uh, it just means that they're not going to be actively like 10 a.m. They're in the office. They're picking up the, the phone and making calls for you. Exactly. Because they're only getting a small percentage of what you make, which means you cannot expect your rep to do all the work for you. Wouldn't that uh, be nice? And and also to get extremely huh. frustrated with them for not doing those things in the time frame that you want them to do yeah. them, which I've done as well. You know, I, I mean, I was stupid right. enough to actually blow off my agent at William Morris because I perceived that he wasn't doing any work for me. I mean, it was the stupidest thing I ever did, but I was just extremely frustrated that things weren't happening in the time frame I had in my mind. Yep. And also, I think um, we sometimes, uh, again, think that now that we are signed, of course, things are going to happen right now. I'm a quote unquote, working writer right now because I got signed. So I can, you know, yeah, I can expect to sit poolside and write on, on work on my scripts by tomorrow. And that's just often, most of the time, not the case. And, and this segues uh, very well into the second thing here, expecting your rep to do all the work for you. I mean, basically it's, it's, it's more of the same, um, you know, look, we, 
we again it's that sort of mindset of yeah now i can just go sit by the pool and and write and other people will continue marketing for me but you know i can tell you that pretty much every deal that i have gotten in my life every rewrite job every script i've ever gotten set up has been a direct result of me doing it not an agent or a manager at some point i will call the agents or the manager and i will loop them in and let them kind of take the ball and run with it when i've already connected the dots to the point where it makes sense to bring them in but in terms of them actually like proactively calling me and saying yeah look they've gotten me plenty of meetings yeah absolutely then you have to go in there and you still have to do the work you have to sell yourself you've got to write synopses you've got to you know do all the the various hoop jumping the, the multiple pitches to various different people because well you know okay i like it but now come back and let's pitch it to the whole management team or now let's come back and pitch it to these executives at this film company and you have to do the whole dog and pony show over and over again there's always just constantly things that you need to be doing so getting to that point where you know we can just go live the life of riley uh i've never gotten to that point i don't have you anna oh god no 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 <laughs> No, I mean, even when they love your stuff, you still wind up doing, you, you know, someone put it, very, I can't remember who it was, one of my, one of my uh, TV writing friends put it very well. She said, you know, they're getting 10% of your income, so you need to expect them to do 10% of the work. <laughs> and yeah. I just, I try to keep that in mind, but it's not exactly the way I would like them to. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. Uh, which brings us to number three, writers, needy, and neurotic. What are we talking about? Oh, <laughs> and we're all needy and neurotic. That's why we're saying them. that. <laughs> so look, I mean, you know, I, I have sabotaged more relationships with agents and managers that I have had throughout my life than uh, most people, I would say. Um, like I said, been at this three decades. That's a lot of people to get all needy and neurotic on and a lot of a lot of relationships to sabotage. Eventually, after about 20 years or so, I kind of started to figure out what, what what I was doing wrong. But if I could go back and do it all over again, yeah, probably wouldn't be. Look, OK, so we all have a tendency to be needy and neurotic. We We all as writers, I think it's built into our DNA. We need that validation. You know, we 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 need to know that you know we're, we're not just writing in a vacuum otherwise we would be novelists or or play well not playwrights that doesn't that doesn't really work but you know um or write blogs or something no no there's feedback for okay never mind i don't know what i'm talking about but but look it, what, I, what i'm getting at is <laughs> we sabotage ourselves it's what we do you know we we haven't heard back from someone in two weeks and we start freaking out okay should i call how long should i wait till i call uh all right i'll just send one email i'm not going to directly ask have you read my screenplay yet but i'll just be like hey dude i'm having a super bowl party just wanted to check in you know or something like we will we'll manufacture some excuse why we need to just go and remind whoever it is that we've sent something to and you know uh, uh, either they don't care or you know or, or they do care but but either way they, they they're not, it's not like they've forgotten about you no one ever forgets about you things go into tracking sheets when you make a submission eventually they'll either get back to you or they won't and if they won't then that means it's a pass it, it, silence is the industry's way of saying uh, not for us, or we didn't care for it. That's it. And unfortunately, that's 97% of the time. Um, and we need to learn to somehow be okay with that. And that is very, very hard. And let me just jump in and say that, Jim, I think you just did something very similar last week because we were sending our movie to someone and they hadn't gotten yep. back to us in like yep. a 10 day time frame. Yep. Jim got all needy and neurotic and <laughs> sent an email and the guy wrote back and, oh, I'm so sorry, but I'm dealing with a sick child right now. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I can lecture everybody on not making these mistakes while doing them. That's how I can multitask. <laughs> exactly. And I'm sure you've done that, too. Oh, sure. I, I do that like once a week. Uh, I think the um, <laughs> it's hard. I think, you know, it's 
that same part of your brain that tells you that whatever you're writing isn't good enough, you know, because you, you need somebody to tell you. So all of a sudden you have this outside person who is, you know, invested in your work and you just need them to tell you that they're, that it's, 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 you're going in the correct path. And that lack of patience is so, is so hard to get past. I mean, I think it's, it's something that takes writers decades and decades to figure out. Most of us probably never will entirely, but right. you know, just, just keep in mind that your rep has a lot of other plates spinning at the same time. Like I learned not to call or not to expect my manager to read anything while she's busy trying to get her bigger clients staffed every year. Like that's because she doesn't have time, you know, I'll send her an email and I won't hear back for months, but then the rest of the year I can get a hold of her within half an hour. So it's just, it's just a question of understanding, understanding what the other person is, is going through at the time, you know, that's going to prevent them from getting to your material and also just being gracious about a pass. You know, some people are just not going to connect with your material. That's just, okay, great. Move on to the next one. Yeah. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. I've also, you know, heard from agents and managers that I've interviewed over the years that, um, you know, they, they do have a certain amount of tolerance for neurotic and needy writers. I mean, they kind of have to if they're working with them all the time and everyone is. So, you know, you're probably not going to destroy your relationship with that person if you do it once or twice. They're just going to, like any of our other friends who are needy and neurotic, if they're good people, will just go, oh, that's just so-and-so being so-and-so. If you do it all the time, though, then it becomes a problem. Um, you know, and I, I forget who told me once that they were like, sure, I'm okay with the occasional check-in, you know, and uh, it, 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 they actually, I think it was Richard Arlick, actually, um, from the Arlick group who used to be used to be the head of literary at Gersh for many, many years. But uh, he said, yeah, you know, um, the occasional check-in is great. I like that. And sometimes it will remind me, oh yeah, this person, yeah, I should actually pay more attention to them. These, you know, you just have to be judicious about when you use those check-ins. Uh, do it too much and you will then become a pest and you do not want to be a pest. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And. The other thing you don't want to do is apparently shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> in other words, mishandling the politics of assignments or mishandling your, uh, any politics of any office environment. So, all right, look, as I said on our blog post promoting this webinar, um, I, I told a little story, which is absolutely true, of how I basically destroyed a studio deal that I had back in the day uh, by mishandling the politics of that particular assignment. What I did not understand at the time uh, is that nobody gives a shit what the screenwriter thinks. Um, once you, and, and <laughs> it's true. I mean, once you understand that and realize you have no power um, and kind of accept it and make peace with it, your life will be much better. So, what you do need to understand when you're actually working and getting assignments is people want you to be a yes man or a yes woman. They don't want to, they don't want you to say, no, I don't think I can do that. They want you to go, okay, let me see what I can do with that. Sure. I'll give it my best shot. I'll make it work. Don't worry. Let me, give me two weeks and I'll come back and I'll, I'll bring you something. That's what they want to hear. They want that easy to work with person who no matter how stupid their ideas are, um, will try to make it work. But what I did in this particular scenario I was alluding to was um, I was working on a Go movie and I was working with the head of the company at the time. And I had a meeting with the head of the company and he gave me all of his notes for what he wanted on this screenplay that they had paid me to develop for them that I had already written. Um, I believe it was an extended outline of I don't think I'd written first draft yet. And I listened to all of his ideas. And, you know, I was sitting there smiling and saying, OK, OK, that sounds good. That sounds good. Like you're supposed to, even though in my head I was thinking, oh, my God, that's terrible. How am I ever going to make this work? This is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. But I walked out of there with a smile on my face, which which you're supposed to do, being that cool, easy to work with person. And then I went full on neurotic, crazy writer. I couldn't handle it. I was just I started obsessing over it. It, it, it literally gave me. Uh, intestinal distress just from thinking, my God, this guy's notes, they're so terrible. How am I going to make this work? Ah! So what I did was I talked to the second person down the ladder at that company who was a producer who I had become friendly with. And I confided in that person and I said, 
how am I going to make these notes work? These are the worst ideas I've ever heard in my life. What am I going to do? And he calmly listened and, you know, feigned empathy uh, and said, yeah, you know, I, I understand completely. You know, just do your best. Do do the best with it you can. If you can't make it work, you can't make it work, but at least give it a try. And the next day I was fired. So um, nobody cares what you think. All right. So here's you as a screenwriter and as ridiculous as this sounds, if you have not earned the 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 right to actually, you know, weigh in on something in a way where people will listen to you. In other words, if you're just a right, uh, you know, an emerging writer for hire and you don't have an Oscar or something like that, people probably aren't going to really care that much about what you think. They just want you to do what they are paying you to do and their patience is only going to go so far so um be careful don't do what i did that's not good and that's just one example i've got many more yeah i mean it also <laughs> comes down to um yeah what play you gotta play it very close to the best in situations uh like those like in in the previous example uh jim made the mistake to confide to the wrong person uh and of course that cost him uh the deal if uh if you're in a situation and you know you always try to do what they want and you have to be well diplomatic but also you can you know if their ideas are really terrible, um, you know, you can come up with better ideas and let them think those were their ideas, which is usually a good defense mechanism you can employ. I think we need to talk about the producer who we just finished suing, Tanya. <laughs> oh, God. With, with, without mentioning this person by name, yes, but... We, um, yeah. So, so, so in this, although we probably should, but let's not right now. Um, so, so this person hired us to write a screenplay and this person, you know, has some credits and is fairly well known. And, uh, so we, we did a, uh, you know, a, a pretty good job writing the screenplay for this person. And, and this person was happy and then, uh, hired us to write another screenplay. So we we're like, okay, great. All, all good. You know, the payment came through on the first one. Um, that's all fine. The second one, however, was a train wreck of, you know, uh, Everestian, uh, you know, scale. Uh, it, it, we did our best to make this thing work. But at the end of the day, her ideas were just not implementable. And, it, you know, we we came up with a with a working draft that we thought was the best possible version of this material and sent it to this producer. And this producer's notes were not implementable. They were terrible. They were absolutely terrible. So again, being as political as we possibly could, we did implement those notes. We fought back a little bit on some of them and we tried to steer this producer to, into the light. Um, but in, in, in a few instances, we just simply didn't do what that producer said to do. On a few things we did, but you know, I, I think we prob probably bent over about as much as we possibly could, as anybody possibly could, because the ideas were just so fundamentally wrongheaded. Um, we delivered that draft. The producer then ceased communications, uh, did not like what we had handed in at all, did not pay us. And uh, we had to get the WGA in to help us. And um, and it still hasn't settled. We are still and we, we just went for a hearing at the WGA uh, a couple of months ago, which we won, by the way. Um, and uh, we're still waiting for payments. So um, I, I think we handled the politics there pretty well. Yeah, we did. But still, you know, things can go wrong because you're dealing with all kinds of people in this business. And, you know, some are mentally more stable than others. Yes. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a diplomatic way of putting it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Anna, do you have uh, anything to add? No, I don't think it, I don't think I can top that. <laughs> that's uh, that's yeah. Um, I have definitely misread. I've definitely misread what what was expected of me on assignments. I think that's you know the, there's a learning. Unfortunately, it's a pretty steep drop, but there is a learning curve. I mean, the, each time you go into a new project, uh, each time you get a new assignment, or each time you you know, take on a new script, you're going to learn something about the people you're working with, and you'll learn you'll learn the cues as you go along, you know, I mean, there's no way to completely bulletproof yourself against these kinds of problems, but, um, 
but hopefully, you know, experience will help you kind of, you know, at least take some basic precautions. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so let's come to the biggest mistake, strangely, that writers seem to make, which is not writing. Yeah, so over and over again, when I interviewed uh, agents and managers for my column over the years, um, they said this was the biggest mistake that writers make all the time, just simply not writing. And it goes like this. Um, you know, you get signed, you've got a, a piece of material that that person or a couple pieces of material that that person, the agent or the manager really, really likes. Uh, they shop it around the town. You get some meetings. Um, something either happens or it doesn't happen. But either way, two years go by and you haven't written anything new and you've got a lot of excuses. Oh, yeah. You know, my kid's been sick or, yeah, I've been working on this, that and the other thing. But at the end of the day, you have no new piece of material to give to or you to your representative to shop this is the number one career killer in town well that and mishandling the politics of assignments but once you're represented those are the two biggest things the two biggest ways that people kill their career and it's why emil gladstone once told me that the average life expectancy of a screenwriter in hollywood once you get signed is five to ten years it's because of those two things. Now, if you're smart, you know how to extend it and, and keep it going. But m more often than not, one of us will do one of those things, not writing. So, you know, life intercedes, right? We all get into a situation where it's like, well, you know, um, I, I've just been busy doing other things. I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm developing my new product that I'm going to go pitch on Shark Tank. I'm going to go do this, that, and the other thing. And then all of a sudden writing becomes the least important thing because, hey, I've got a script. Uh, I've got a calling card. My manager is out there shopping it right now. What you need to understand is that there is an expiration date for that. Your agent or your manager will shop your script or calling card for a certain period of time. And then after that, they get bored. They don't want to keep shopping that the town, all the usual suspects has all read it. I mean, maybe there's someone new who comes along who's opened a new film fund or whatever, and they can still use that same calling card. I mean, lots of times you can get many years of stuff out of a new calling card, but it's not going to engage your agent or your manager. They need new material. They need to see you constantly creating, hopefully two to three or more pieces of material per year that is their expectation because guess what they're salespeople. they need to sell things that's how they make money if you're not giving them things to sell what's going to happen they're going to kick your ass to the curb because there's nothing for them to sell exactly and i think um it comes down to knowing yourself in other words how do you how do you structure your day? What do you prioritize? And you need to priorita prioritize your writing. And for some people, that takes the form of giving themselves deadlines, because often we do a lot more work when we have a deadline. And um, sometimes those have to be artificial deadlines, because if you're writing something on spec, it's not like anyone's waiting for it. But you still have to manage to get your writing in. So, you know, shoot for writing every day. And even if it's just you're researching something, you're looking something up, even if it's just that, that's something. But yes, you have to really do something every single day. And it's really tough to do that because, you know, oftentimes we're exhausted from from work or the kids or or, or whatever it is that's going on in our world. We're, and we're just, you know, emotionally spent. And, and the last thing we want to do is, you know, fire up the laptop and sit there and try to be creative. Look, I, I, I am certainly, you know, not someone to lecture people on this because I am terrible at it. It, it is my number one biggest bugaboo. Um, you know, there, there have been times when I've gone a year or two without having a new piece of material. And yes, like I said before, I've made this mistake. I have lost a manager from not writing. And in fact, recently in the in the 2000, the, the 2010s, even this happened to me. And specifically because, um, you know, I had been writing something unpaid uh, on assignment for a well-known director. Uh, that my manager had gotten for me, got me this gig, 
So, you know, I, I spent a lot of time working on this project that ultimately wound up going nowhere. Script turned out great. It just uh, just didn't go anywhere. The They just weren't feeling it on that end. So that chewed up a lot of my creative time to generate something that was a big nothing. Um, you know, producing movies because coveraging films had uh, and, and still is continuing to produce movies. So that chewed up a lot of creative time. And at the end of the day, there was like a two year period of time where my manager just uh, he said, look, you know, I'm really sorry, but, um, you know, you haven't given us anything. It's been almost two years. So, um, you know, look, doors always open here, which is agent or manager speak for uh, don't let the door hit you on the ass on the way out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Anna, do you want to add to that? <laughs> well, I mean, this is it's the ongoing problem. You know, that's always been my biggest issue that finding the balance between, you know, paycheck work to pay the bills and finding time to write uh, is always, always, always a problem, always. So yeah, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that there isn't really a good answer except to just do it because, you know, you can have a million excuses for why you can't write. There's somebody out there who is willing to work harder than you are. <laughs> and that's, that's, the, that's the sad truth. It's like, if you're gonna, if, you're gonna, if you wanna be in this business, you have to just keep at it and you have to prioritize it. And it's not something that, you know, you can, that everyone's going to be good at automatically. I mean, you know, I've been writing for 20 years and I'm still terrible at making the writing a priority. So it's every year, my new year's resolution starts with write more every day. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, just, I just wrote that down yesterday again. I mean, I've gotten to a point where I put post-it notes up on the wall. So I see them at eye level everywhere I go, you know. Um, <laughs> All right, look here. Okay, look here. Here's an easy trick, which um, yeah, I have used from time to time, which is as Tanya said, deadlines, right? Um, so there's always, you know, the big festivals, the the seven big festivals, you know, they're they're ongoing throughout the year. There's a deadline for you right there. You know, you want to you want to submit to um, you know, the nickel. You know. That that deadline is coming up in when is it May? I don't, I don't even know. Whatever, but um, but you know that's a deadline. Okay. All right, but 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 just be careful because a lot of people and and we've seen this happen with our with our clients. They get so fixated on having a draft ready to submit so that they could get it into Nickel or Scriptapalooza or whatever that um, they wind up sending in something that isn't ready. And this goes back to the very first thing we discussed an hour ago. Um, you know, look, having that deadline for the contest doesn't mean you have to submit it. It's great that that deadline is there and by all means, use it to motivate you to get something done. But if the script is still a pass pass, by the time of that deadline, save your money. Don't send it in. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to do what you want it to do. There's always another festival down the line. So use whatever tricks you need to use to motivate you. Festival deadlines, contest deadlines, they're all great. Um, but that doesn't mean you should skip rule number one, which is don't send out something. Or was was it rule number two? I forget. Uh, don't send out something before it's time, like Paul Masson. Paul Masson shall make no wine before it's time i don't know old commercial <laughs> I'm, you're I'm dating old. yourself okay I am. I'm old. <laughs> all right let's come to our q a so please find the text box which should be in your uh the question box in your lower right hand corner and start asking questions okay first question writers who insist on directing their scripts good or a bad mistake Huh, that's an interesting question. I kind of like that. Okay, well, look, I, 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 I'd actually, Anna, yeah, you go for it, Anna. I'd like to hear what you have to say. I was, I was gonna say, um, it's, it's a, it's a good idea, and it's a terrible mistake. I mean, like, <laughs> directing is just, it's such a different animal. Like, I think if you have, if you have the, the resources, if you, you know. If you have the resources, if I, if, if, when I started out here, you know, 20 years ago or so, uh, if I had said, oh, I want to direct, I'm going to direct this movie, you know, that would have been a massively huge mistake because I didn't know anybody. I didn't know what I was doing. I couldn't figure out how to do it. You know, 20 years down the line, having produced a bunch of stuff and uh, knowing a lot more people and knowing a little bit more about how to find the money and how to get it together, I would be a lot more confident about directing my own material. Um, 
that being said, you know, I, I do think that it, there's a danger of trying to be an auteur. You know, I, I think there are very few people who can pull it off uh, with, with a plum, as it were. <laughs> you know, you tend to get a little tunnel visioned about your own material. And I think having that, that outside uh, perspective of someone else taking something you've written and, and bringing it to life may actually make for a better product for the majority of people. But, but it's not always true. You know, some, some people are very good at that. I mean, I know some writers that they should be directing. They should absolutely be directing. And I know some writers who like, please don't ever let them get, get behind a camera, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yes and no, that, that would be my, yeah. Yeah, and I think it also depends on the situation. For example, if you're a, a new writer and you have a script and a producer likes your script and, you know, it's, you know, within their production budget, great. So they want to, you know, option it and uh, maybe make it and you go in there and you go, but I want to direct. Wow. Um, this person is going to say, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no. <laughs> I don't know you from Adam and yeah. you seem to be difficult to work with. So let's forget about, you know, all of the above. Look, so here's, the, can... here's the information we're missing. Has this person directed before? Look, nobody, if, right. if we're talking that you have to go try to get someone else's money to make this movie, um, no one is going to give you any money to direct this movie unless you've proven that you can direct. You can't just say, I'm a director. You need to have uh, at least a couple of shorts that have, you know, that are up on YouTube or Funny or Die or have gotten into festivals or, or whatever. You need to demonstrate that you can do this because there is no excuse to not do this in 2019. Okay. Anybody can shoot a freaking movie on their phone nowadays it doesn't even matter if the sound isn't any good or, or or anything if you can shoot something that is a coherent story even commercial 60 second commercial if you if you can tell a story in 60 seconds and in a demo commercial and put your reel up on youtube then you've done something and then that shows people oh okay well they know what they're doing they've done something but time and again we've seen people who literally have never done anything who have expectations that people are going to give them money what no no you need to do it do it and show you can do it and then people may give you money or you may still have to crowdfund it and figure out a way to do it yourself when there's nothing wrong with that either exactly on to the next question what is a hip pocket Okay, so hip pocket is, um, I think we covered this in, a, in another webinar actually. Hip, hip pocket is a, is a term that means you are an unofficial client of an agent or a manager. Um, it usually means that you found an agent or a manager who uh, is um, either an established person who doesn't have room in their roster to bring you on yet, but they still kind of like what you're doing. And so they're willing to take your calls and are possibly willing to maybe lift a finger and send an email or two on your behalf. Or more frequently, it's an emerging agent or manager, like, like an assistant, for example, who knows that they're going to be promoted at some point and they've already started putting together their lists. That's a great place to be in, by the way. You you do want to be hip pocketed, but well, you want to be hip pocketed by anybody. It's always a good place to be in because it, there's the only place you can go from there is up. Eventually, if you do well and and you you handle the uh, politics of that situation well, when that person does have an opening, they will bring you aboard as a full fledged client. Or when that person is promoted, they will sign you. So it's really, you know, look, I've been hip pocketed many times. Oftentimes the only difference is whether there's a piece of paper saying you're signed to the agency or the management company or not. Um, usually, you know, hip pocketed means you're in the door and that's a good place to be in. From there, you just have to prove yourself. Excellent. Okay, on to the next one. Um, I sent out my script after pitching at Virtual Pitch Fest, and uh, I sent it to a few places, and that was three months ago. What should I do? <laughs> okay. Well, um, so Virtual Pitch Fest, um, I mean, it, it, it's it's a great way to open doors, but you are coming in at the lowest, lowest, lowest level of priority. To any of these people uh it generally means they like the idea and they're willing to take a look but they will take a look 
when they have time. And when they have time could mean never, honestly. Look, uh, it, it, these people, I mean, it depends on the level of these of who these people are. But let's say it's, um, you know, a, a development uh, executive or a development executive assistant, right? These people generally have to read, you know, five or six scripts on a weekend uh, and sometimes two scripts on a weekday night after they get back from dinner and drinks, which is like nine o'clock, you come home, you feed the cat, you take care of your emails, you do all the things you need to do. And then you sit down and somehow in the in the remaining hour of free time that you have, you've got to read two scripts. All right. It's extremely stressful. There's always things that are more important than your scripts. Client scripts, they need to read first. Uh, anything, if they're tracking which means following what a studio or a production company buys. If, if they're a tracking person, which is what a lot of people do in town, that means they have to read every single thing that that studio or that production company is uh, buying or making, pilots, whatever it is. They've got to read it, okay, um, so that they are they are up to snuff. So look, it, at, the, at the end of the day, you just need to understand that your stuff is not going to be a huge priority to them. So what can you do? Well, there's really only t only three things. Number one, just ignore it and hope that they'll get back to you whenever they may not. Um, it could just be a pass, by the way. They might have looked at it. They might have sent it out for coverage and you just didn't hear back. Uh, and again, nothing you can do. Uh, the second thing that you can do is try to create some heat on your own as best you can. Um, it doesn't always work, but you know, if you've got anything else going on, like let's say you just found out that you just made the semifinals of the nickel, for example. Well, that's a great excuse to send an email. You know, hey, so um, I, I sent in my script a couple of months ago. I haven't heard back. Just wanted to let you know uh, I just hit the semis of the nickel. So, um, I mean, as far as they know, you could win the nickel because you haven't you haven't been eliminated yet. So, something like that you can use to kind of create this sort of patina of heat or something going on in your in your screenplay um you know hey my new my new project just got into my, my new film that i co-wrote uh just got into uh slam dance it's going to be screening at slam dance send an email anything anything like that creates an excuse to to contact these people and the third and, and final thing you can do is just you know just send them a reminder email cold uh you'll probably not hear anything back and if you if you do not hear back you'll know that uh, it was a pass or they're just simply not interested, whatever. I mean, look, you, what you need to understand about virtual pitch fest is these people get paid for every query that they read. Not much, just a couple of bucks, but every single one that they read, they, they get paid. So it's in their best interest to read and respond to the queries, but doesn't necessarily mean they really plan on reading them. Often they do, and no dig against virtual pitch fest. I got signed off virtual pitch fest once, so I'm a fan, but you know, if you're coming in cold, you, you got to give them a reason to prioritize reading your script sometimes. All right, on to the next question. And we also get that a lot. Is it a must that a working writer live and work in LA? Tanya, well, I know, uh, yeah. I know, I know yeah. you, you, you've handled this one. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I, um, you know, the world is becoming more and more global, and uh, so you can really write from anywhere. However, uh, especially when you're first breaking in, you do want to be in Los Angeles because you want to be, A, able to network, and don't forget how important networking it is, it is to network. So you want to be able to network and you want to be able to go to meetings. Uh, you want to be able to be, you know, in front of people. However, if you're not currently in LA, um, the way to go is to study your craft, to learn absolutely everything you can and to write killer materials to so have a few scripts ready that got, you know, consider, consider, and then pack up your bags and move to LA and do, you know, your networking circuit. And, you know, after, um, if you're established, like extremely established, then yeah, you can work from anywhere. Yeah, okay, and exactly. Okay, next question. Once you have a consider, what's the best way to get your script to an agent? A production co or a production company cold calling seems impossible. 
Oh, well, okay. So look, there, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but, um, you know, so much of it is about third party validation. Um, if you just, you know, are, are just cold querying people, it doesn't matter if you have a consider or not, you know, even if you say like, yeah, I've got this, this consider from coverage Inc, you know, they may or may not care. Um, you know, because they may not know us, they may know us. And if they do great, maybe it'll, that'll count for something, but it may not. Uh, and you know, what what matters to these people usually is validation from a source that they know and care about, like someone they deal with all the time, a producer that they know, for example, just someone who, um, uh, you know, a, a well-known contest, for example, like if you do well in, in the top top 10 contests that are out there, we all know who they are. Um, uh, or blacklist, you know, bl getting good scores on blacklist. The, the industry kind of all knows if you get good scores on blacklist, this is something worth reading. Those are the ways that you actually get people to pay attention. Um, having knowing that you have a consider, that's extremely important because it means okay, now I'm ready to start doing all these things. But it may not be it may not be what you need to actually get everyone to pay attention. It may. I mean, it's worth a shot. Uh, you know, I've certainly done it where you send out queries saying, you know, I got to consider from so and so or whatever, and it has worked and sometimes it doesn't work. Um, you just need to expect that the ratio of non response may be slightly higher, but unless there's something else like third party validation or some sort of heat coming from somewhere, uh, it will only be slightly higher than the percentage that you would get otherwise. Excellent. All right. And that is it. So thank you Yay! so much, guys. And just remember, if you have any questions in between webinars or whatever, you can always email us at info at coverageinc.com. Also, if you have any ideas, like things you want us to cover in future webinars, just like go ahead, let us know, send us an email. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Anna. You guys rock.